Yeah, the talk's slightly odd, and I'm not talking about fish and chips. I'm talking about uh, fish as chips. And uh, the sort of journey that we're going to go on, which is probably an exaggeration if I've got 15 minutes, is as follows. Um, we're going to talk about historical predictions in terms of fish demography, largely based on the European experience. We're then going to go and look at the realisation that tropical fish are, in fact, a lot older um, than we originally thought, based on the European view. And then we're going to venture into some of the more recent research, which I'll present some data of my own, which is there's a whole range of families out there which are actually ridiculously short-lived. And finally, you know, why would you bother? Um, what I want to point out is some applications of what you'd use um, these types of data for. So here we go, we're off to Europe. Now, Clupea harangus, which is the European herring, is incredibly important in Europe. It's on every plate, pretty much, whether it's roll mop herrings or um, uh, you know, a whole range of other recipes that you might have. Uh, it lives to something like 12 to 16 years, which is a, quite amazing uh, for a kipper. Okay, the cod, which of course has been the basis of many European economies over a long period of time, um, incredibly important to economies and also in terms of diet. I'm being curtailed, okay. Um, okay, so the cod, very important as well, living to about 25 years. So if you were brought up in the, um, you know, a few decades ago, which some of us were, the type of paradigm that came out of all this was, first of all, that it's going to be really hard to age fish in the tropics for a start, because they probably won't have annually. Secondly, because things happen really fast, both metabolically and for a whole range of other reasons, they're probably very short-lived, and hey, who cares? Let's fish the living daylights out of them. Now, Professor Choate lurched around the Pacific well-armed and um, told us uh, something a little different, and... The reality was when he looked at uh, fishes like surgeon fish, for example, here we have Achenthinus lineatus, uh, we have Olivaceus, Tenochetus, and also Zebrasoma. It's the normal axes of age on X and standard length on Y. And the obvious thing is that look at the age. You know, the, a whole range of fishes, many of them are living to past 30 years. In fact, some of them are even getting up to 40 years. So some of these are actually older than the average cod, which is quite a surprise to uh, many, many people. Now, the uh, Plectropomus leopardus, which of course is the coral trout, and we heard a, a long discourse on that last night from Morgan. Um, this accounts for something like 60% of the fishery on the Great Barrier Reef. On the southern GBR, it's as high as 90%. Incredibly important fish. Even that lives to 15 or 16 years old. Now, the next one's a real shock to you. This is the dorky fish that you see sitting under rocks. Um, the coral cod, quite cute, look a bit like a, um, a Plectropomus, but their caudal fin is very round, and they look like they've got, got the IQ of a very sick hamster. Um, they, these things actually live for decades, and in some cases over 50 years, and these are data from David Welsh and others. Now, even the humble Pomacentris molochensis, where a monster molochensis is about this long, these guys from uh, Tony Fowler and Peter Doherty demonstrate live up to 19 years old. So the whole paradigm of this kind of, you know, everything in the tropics going to be high turnover and short-lived was pretty much thrown out the window. Now, the next adventure that came along was the inimitable Professor Burwood, um, who published in the Dubchesky on um, these funky little gobies, Eviota, published a paper in Current Biology about the world's shortest lived vertebrate. In fact, uh, David, once again, using his uh, style, called them Tim Tams, where they taste good, but they don't live very long. Now, the life of one of these Eviotas is pretty miserable. You live for about 60 days. Um, a third of your entire life is as a larva, and everyone knows it's pretty rough at that stage. You've got about 10 days to mature. Now, you've only got about 30-odd you know, days for a spawnathon before you, before you actually die. So that was a different story that was coming out, and a contribution from my lab has been as follows. There's a, there's a range of other groups. Now, whether you want to call them Tim Tams or, or Crispies, at the end of the day, it depends on your taste, and they all slide down very easily. Um, the first one is Spratiloides delicatulis, which is an incredibly important clupeid on the Great Barrier Reef. Remember that uh, Harangus, which is the European herring, living for over 12 years. Now, these are incredibly common on reefs. In fact, we've done light trap samples from Lizard Island all the way down to the Capricorn Bunker Group. They can be up to 80% of the catch, so very abundant in terms of um, these little guys. And there's a big cloud of them on the right-hand side there. Now, everything eats them. I mean, Lujanids love them, the coral trout love them. Um, pretty much anything. Little long tongs will love them, and even the odd goby probably lurches off the bottom to grab one of these guys as they swim past. Now, here are some dates looking a little congested. On the top left there we have Lizard Island, we go over to Cairns, down to Townsville, 
Uh, and well, actually, this one should be not near Townsville at all. That should be down near One Tree Island, uh, which is a long way from Townsville. Um, now, the red line actually represents 50 days. So I'm not talking about years here. We're talking about days. Um, and you can see at One Tree Island, a little about the longest, you know, something like just over 100 days. Uh, around here, up near Lizard Island, you're lucky to get anywhere near 100 days. Now, the little arrow on the right-hand side there is validation with uh, tetracycline. So what we do is throw these guys in the tank, give them tetracycline, and a bit like that nightclub vision that we saw recently of um, how fluorescent light illuminates, you can actually put them in a tank for a number of days and demonstrate, in fact, they are daily rings. So we did that for quite large fish, and you could clearly see the increments in the otoliths were daily. So very, very short-lived. So from data right across the reef and over uh, quite long distances all the way down to one tree, the age max is very between 68 and 147. We couldn't quite pip Eviota for the world's shortest lived uh, uh, vertebrate. And there's also a clear gradient from north to south where the oldest fish are actually in the south. Now, again, life is miserable as a clue paid. You really are floating around as a chippy or a Tim Tam, is that, you know, between one and three percent of the population is wiped out every day. You know, so it's, um, it's kind of nasty. Now here's another cute one. Now this one was a huge shock to me because I expected something completely different based on uh, Peter Doherty and Tony Fowler's work. Now that's the neon dams or Pomacentra celestis and um, one of David's colourful bobbles he mentioned previously. Um, here is a reef. Now you might think it looks like backscatter, but there's a whole bunch of little blue things in there. Whenever you have a disturbed environment, Pomacentra celestis wipes, you know, pretty much takes over everything in terms of a small planktivore. Now, looking at them when they're very young, they have beautiful daily rings in them. There again is uh, some validation. You can tell how long they've been in the plankton, which is about 20 odd days. Now, I thought based on Fowler and Doherty, these things have lived to about 18 years. But if you look really carefully, and you probably can't see that very well, there's actually 131 rings in that otolith. There are no clear annulite, which is very much like the otolith that you saw in that palm centris lestis. So that guy, 51 or 56 uh, millimetres standard length, is an absolute thumper of a palm centris celestis. And here's the uh, age-size relationship here. Uh, standard length and age again at a couple of reefs on the southern GBR. The oldest one we got was um, close to 160 days. So here's the age max the top 5%, Lizard Island, age max 127, um, uh, down at One Tree Island, 155 days. So again, incredibly uh, short-lived. And if you look at the otoliths, it's quite different to congeners. On the bottom, we have Molochensis, which lives to 19. Look how fat that otolith is. In fact, the ratio of uh, sort of length to depth is you know, pretty much 50%, whereas Celestis has a much narrower otolith in terms of the accretion of calcium carbonate. So it's not laying down as much, and that's not a great surprise given it's um, very short-lived. So the next one is uh, Osterhynchus dodolini, or now Apagon, depending on uh, who you talk to these days. Um, these are mouth-breeding fish. We've always known they're pretty cheap anyway, but they, they live for 16 to 26 uh, days on the plankton. They then settle out onto sandy substrata, normally on little patch reefs, pretty much avoiding mum and dad because they probably get eaten at night. And then they settle to um, caves as they, as they get a little bit older. Okay, again, they have beautiful increments in them. This one, uh, there's a very young one, about 21 days. Again, tetracycline is validation. Uh, right down the bottom here, quite a large fish, and there's 90 beautiful rings right out to the edge there. Again, no annuli. So if you look at a Dodolini, you are really lucky to get to one year old. In fact, if you look at that relationship there, to get past 200 days, you're doing pretty well. And anyone who's dived on reefs, and right back to the days of Peter Sale counting stuff on patch reefs, normally these things are dying so fast, you've barely got time to count them, because you've lost a few um, by the time you finish writing on your slate. Now, so look, the take home message is there's actually a, a wide diversity of chips out there that live hard and die young. And uh, in a recent paper we got out on Dodolini, there's a review table, they're looking at some of the families that appear to be in this cheapest chips type bracket. That includes the gobies, which David has already published on, the apigonidae, at least for the species who looked, the sprats, which are really surprising, um, the blennies, uh, and some of the damselfish, which we all thought, despite being multicolored bobbles, some of them are living for uh, years, some of them are only living for days, and there's a huge contrast in terms of their life history. Um, I'd suggest you things like the clupeids, huge for fisheries right throughout the Pacific. In fact, it always disturbs me, these um, 
uh, you know, pretty much the whole idea of fishing for tuna with those clupeids, because they rip them off reefs and tip them in the ocean to catch tuna with, when in fact they're an incredibly important trophic group on uh, reefs right throughout the Pacific. So why should we care? Look, at the end of the day, when you're looking at population dynamics of reef fish, we're talking about variables that include reproductive output, larval survival, uh, pathways of connectivity, post-settlement process, and longevity. Now, the reason I say that is that a major part of my program on the Southern Great Barrier Reef has been looking at connectivity between reefs separated by kilometres to tens of kilometres. That includes Heron Island, One Tree, Sykes, Fitzroy, and Lamont. So knowing about age actually matters. And the reason I say that is um, there was a finding that was really unexpected that we published in PNAS a few years ago, Gabby Gerlach and some of my other collaborators. Well, we found when you look at these reefs and look at something like these little apigonas, there are genetic differences between reefs separated by kilometres, which is quite astonishing, given in the good old days, you'd have actually thought they'd be swept down to Sydney in the holidays almost. Um, now, it's not just that simple. The other thing is these change through time. It's a pretty nasty graph. But um, you've got one tree here in Sykes, Fitzroy and Lamont. I'll draw your attention to the far left, which is One Tree Island. The, the different colours represent different genotypes. You can see from 2003 to 2012, there's a lot of the yellow genotype. In contrast, if you look at Lamont, which is only a few kilometres away, you've gone from red to green to yellow to green to whatever, and all the way through. So the, dominant genotype on that reef is actually changing quite dramatically through time. And you might obviously say, why? Well, an obvious reason why is if you're living to 200 days, the potential for massive bottlenecks in terms of recruitment is actually quite colossal. So I'd suggest to you that for looking at these population dynamics, a knowledge of longevity is incredibly important. So for us, our next step is modelling populations with information on connectivity, larval life, and to actually get at things like population turnover to really interpret some of these um, uh, amazing genetic pa patterns. So, look, I guess the take home message today is that fish crisps matter. There's a whole range of groups out there that live for a very short, like pretty much the blowflies of the sea, for yet another metaphor. Um, the, many of these species are incredibly critical in terms of um, uh, food chains and coral reefs. They're the food of a whole range of other taxa. Let's face it, clupeids are born to die. Apigonas look stupid anyway and are going to die. And, there's a, and, and gobies, there's too many of them anyway. It's like 70% of the diversity of many coral reefs. I didn't mention that though. Um, uh, the, I mean, I guess a knowledge of age is actually incredibly important and it will actually allow us to have much more sophisticated models with respect to population dynamics. So, and thank you for listening. Here's the team. Um, uh, Emma Woodcock over there, Marco Callahan, Emily Gerard, someone obvious, um, Gabby Gerlach, and, and Yella Atima. So thank you very much. I'll leave it there.